And we'll start uh, with our first speaker, uh, Dr. Albert Skip Rizzo, who is the director of uh, Virtual uh, Reality Institute in um, Southern California, University of Southern California. Um, Skip is a clinical psychologist which has been working in the area of uh, simulation and avatars and received most of his funding from the US military. In fact, it's a military-funded uh, research institute. Most of the people today uh, are not necessarily military themselves, but have had a great deal of collaboration with the US military who funded many of the project which will be presented. So uh, Dr. Uh, Rizzo, I think, is the best person in the world to talk about use of avatars in training and simulation. Skip. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, well, I can see the people that have a lot of resilience are the ones here after the big night last night. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Um, I want to be talking about uh, the use of virtual humans, and um, I'll try to cover in 15 minutes a number of areas really quickly, um, different ways that we've been able to develop virtual humans and intelligent agents for a wide range of purposes. Um, I'm at the Institute for Creative Technologies, we're an Army UARC, the University Affiliated Research Center, so we get a good bit of funding from the military to develop these sorts of applications. My lab is the MedVR research group, actually, and over the years we've developed simulations across a wide range of areas. And just to show you some of our use of virtual humans um, in a simulation for PTSD, exposure therapy, um, the same simulation about five years ago for a cognitive assessment tool in virtual reality months. where uh, folks after a mild traumatic brain injury could be in a simulation where their attention, memory, and executive function were measured while they're performing actual duties. As well, we also do uh, civilian work. So here's an example of a virtual classroom, what a child would see in a head-mounted display as a turn their head and look around where their task is to pay attention to the board, but meanwhile, distractions in the classroom occur so we can measure attention in these children um, in a controlled stimulus environment that replicates uh, the challenges of the real world. Um, the next one here shows um, a user that's not wearing any instrumentation or markers or anything being tracked with the Microsoft Connect. Her movement is being imparted onto a virtual representation on a game-like context for rehabilitation. So we can do physical therapy, occupational therapy within a very simple context, uh, in a game-like context, to try to make it uh, less boring and less um, painful to do. Um, finally, getting to the point of uh, my talk today, our work with virtual humans. Um, this is a fella from the SimCoach project. Um, we'll see more of him later, but I'll let him introduce himself right now. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking. But I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. So with that said, um, I'd just like to talk very briefly about the history of virtual humans in simulations. Now. If we look back, <clears throat> we can see that before the technology was there to really deliver compelling, intelligent virtual agents that you can interact with, uh, characters were popped into virtual environments for a wide range of purposes, mainly to add realism to the environment or sometimes as props or stimuli for doing exposure therapy for people with simple phobias. We've evolved, and I'll talk more in the second part of the talk, about these areas where we're using virtual agents that have much higher level of interactive capability. Um, we know that this work uh, in the research literature has certainly evolved, and I think it mirrors the advances in the technology in terms of computer processing, computer graphics, um, intelligence, artificial intelligence, and natural language processing, and so forth, voice recognition. Um, but even very primitive states, like in simulations like this for exposure therapy with panic disorder and agoraphobia, we see that virtual humans in their very most primitive form still have a clinical effect, that it was as good as interacting with real people in a, an in vivo exposure application. Same thing with 
wide range of public speaking applications. And these are older ones I include purposely so you can see you know, where some of these things really came from. And in public speaking, we even find that um, people react physiologically different to the different states of the characters that they're talking to. Um, virtual humans have been used in studying addiction uh, with addicts uh, in brain imaging studies, looking at how people's brains react when they're in a high-risk situation. And, and this has been evolved uh, dramatically across addictions, and a wide literature has evolved, well-funded by the National Institute of Health. Um, Here's one uh, where we use virtual humans in an exposure therapy application for treating post-traumatic stress disorder. And they're basically as props, but they react to things in the virtual environment. What you see on the screen is what the user sees as they turn their head and look around the headset. And characters react when real-time events are triggered in the virtual environment. Um, Finally, uh, well, that's some data from that work. Um, finally, even very primitive characters have shown value, particularly with autism. This is um, an early application for training high-functioning autism uh, people on the autistic spectrum, social skills. And that work has continued to evolve where social skills training are being trained with virtual characters in a second life type environment where the character is driven the training character is driven by a person in a remote location. And the data from this small study anyway shows that after interaction within these environments, we see uh, changes in brain function in terms of areas of the brain where individuals access uh, their interaction in social settings. You see improvements pre and post. Well, what about intelligent agents and how can we use them? Now, intelligent virtual agents are really uh, the next generation. These are characters <clears throat> that you can talk to that have software that understand that first off you have voice recognition, you have natural language processing where the voice gets translated to text, it goes into uh, the software, the agent has some understanding and can respond in a credible fashion. Um, we've been doing work at ICT since 1999 in this area, a lot for the military, things like negotiation, training, practicing how you would negotiate with an Afghan village elder, perhaps, cultural sensitivity, leadership skills, and so forth. And that early work, or the ongoing work, drove our initial work developing virtual patients for clinical training. And that was an office, and I'm gonna show a quick video clip of one of our first virtual patients, and you'll see, very primitive. You would never mistake this character for the real thing, but you'll see, uh, a, a medical student in training interacting with a character and getting engaged. Hello, my name is Dr. Davis. Uh, is... Hello. Uh, what, uh, what brings you into the office today? Something bad happened that night. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, can you tell me what happened? I was in the car with Eddie and he stopped the car and wanted me to kiss him, but when I tried to stop him, he threatened me with a knife. Now you'll notice this character has very minimal gestures, you, minimal Justine? facial expressions, but we found initially so that I when people I'm got answers to their questions a couple in a row, all of a sudden the character comes to life for them and they suspend disbelief. It must have been very tough for you. Yeah, it still is. Do you find yourself uh, still being bothered by what happened? So this goes on for a bit. I'm going to jump ahead now um, and also note that in our initial tests with this, clinicians asked the same questions of the virtual agent, the same types of questions in a diagnostic interview as they did with a standardized actor patient. Um, so this drove our work uh, with the military partnering with the USC School of Social Work that has a master's in military social work uh, program. And we started building virtual patients for them. And here's a quick example of one of them for a suicide assessment. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. 
Has he been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicide on base last week? Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He was a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So you can see the, the gradual improvement in the characters, in their look, appearance, and gesture, and in the natural language processing. And the, um, you know, in a nutshell, this gives novice clinicians the opportunity to mess up a bunch with the digital characters before they get their hands on a live one. And I think that's at the core of simulation training. And that's led to some new work funded by Tatric with a virtual human, virtual patient toolkit. So these are examples of the different patients that um, a medical educator can pick from in a library and begin to build test cases online and deliver them online for clinical use. And I'll show a quick video of our um, one of our initial attending physicians that provides feedback after the clinical interaction. Greetings, colleagues. I am Hippocrates 2.0. Made in the image of the great doctor, I am the first of my kind, a synthetic attending physician. Today, I am proud to introduce to you my virtual standardized patients. They listen, respond, and even reason. Like me, they teach and they challenge. Hello. Hello, doctor. I'm Dr. Cole. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. What brings you in today? So this goes on, um, but you get the, the general idea. And the, and the goal here is we didn't want to have to build virtual patients ourself. I mean, I've, I'm a clinician, clinical psychologist, have expertise in some areas, but you really need boots on the ground that know the clinical condition to do the proper authoring and to build nuanced cases for training. And that's what we're trying to do, put this in the hands of users uh, that have expertise. And it's available online as an open source community. Now, one other area, the last one I'll probably have time to cover is building online intelligent healthcare agents. And I'll show one that was built with the idea of allowing service members and veterans to access a character they could talk to online. They were using a text interface um, to find out information about PTSD, traumatic brain injury, substance abuse, but to do it in a confidential, private fashion. People that might not seek care with a live provider, um, but this might be a toe in the water that would get them towards that next step. And um, uh, basically, uh, uh, let me let this video run here. The basic premises here and the fact we're not replacing live clinicians. We're not doing diagnostics and therapy. We're giving people a little bit of comfort in finding out information and so forth. I'll let the video do the talking here. Hi there. The name's William Ford, but you can call me Bill. Welcome to SimCoach. Hi, Bill. So what's SimCoach? SimCoach is a safe place for war fighters and their families to talk about the things that are on their minds. So, who are you? I'm a virtual human, which means that I'm based on the real experiences and personalities of actual war fighters and their families. Anyway, I'm here to listen, and I'm here to help. Anything you want to talk about? Talk to you? How do I do that? Well, you're doing it right now. Just type in regular English. Anything troubling you? If there is, why would I want to talk to you about it? Well, here, I'll tell you what. I made a video that tells you a little bit more. I'm gonna pop it up over here on the right. Not all the wounds of war are physical. When you don't dress a wound, it gets worse, doesn't it? SimCoach is here to talk about the issues weighing on your mind without worrying about anyone finding out about it. You start off by choosing the SimCoach that's right for you. Hi. Hope you weren't waiting long. Welcome to SimCoach. I'm Ellie. Then just type in English. Ellie can listen, understand, and respond. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask a few questions so I can figure out how to help you better. Is that okay? 
everything you say here is completely anonymous, and we've taken a lot of steps to keep it that way. If you don't mind my asking, how's your sleeping been lately? Here's a link on the do's and don'ts of good sleep hygiene. Ellie can send you links to resources, show you a video, administer questionnaires, give you advice, or just tell you a story. So my younger brother Alex was in the Marines and deployed twice. I don't want to say I know what he went through because I All don't. Right, I'm, I'm running over my time, so I just want to finish by saying that in the course of developing this online intelligent agent, um, we had to build an architecture. And along the way, what we did was build an authoring kit, which is available online. You can create natural language processing characters online uh, by selecting a character, authoring dialogue, relatively easy, but not, not totally simple. But you can start to do this, and it's available on our website. And it's driven things like Braveheart, not that Braveheart, but you see here the Atlanta Braves website, part of the Welcome Back Veterans Program, Major League Baseball sponsored. There's a SIM coach that's specifically tailored to the Atlanta area to help people find resources in that area. And so we're able to custom tailor these types of apps. We've done things for the Army where this is a character that, that helps you to uh, track your training uh, status, can dig up your performance in a database, remembers you when you come back in the next week or so. Virtual patient is driven by the SIM coach architecture. Uh, and finally, uh, one that I think is, I just want to say, talk about just for a second, because it's close to my heart. Uh, we take stuff developed for the military and translate it for civilian apps. So this is a job interview trainer for high functioning folks on the autistic spectrum, where you have six different characters, 10 different job backgrounds, and three different behavioral dispositions of the interviewer, and it gives people that are actually quite intelligent and can do a job, practice getting over the hump of a job interview, something they're not so good with, by interacting with a virtual character. That now is being transitioned to the VA uh, for tests, for actually working with service members, uh, 18 to 25 year old service members, 25% unemployment compared to 16% in the civilian population. So we're moving in that direction, and uh, I got a signed football from Dan for doing the work. Anyway, thank you. Sorry I went over. Right. Thank you very much.